Next we'll hear from Maya Berry. Uh, Maya Berry is Executive Director of the Arab American Institute. She steers the Institute's policy agenda. In 1996, she established the Institute's first government relations department, which she led for five years before becoming Legislative Director for House Minority Whip David Bonnier, where she developed policies on international relations, human rights, trades, trade, and immigration. She started her career in public service working for Access, the nation's oldest and largest Arab American human services nonprofit. She's also the founder of Mid AMR Group, a private consulting firm dedicated to enhancing U.S. Arab economic, political, and cultural cooperation. Thanks very much for being here. Shout. I'm just going to project as much as that I can um, in order to help us uh, here. And uh, um, I'm going to try to be as brief in my remarks as possible because I find it most constructive for us to be able to engage in conversation. Um, so the Q&A part is always for me what is uh, what is the best part of the evening. Um, no thank you for having me follow Jeanette. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thanks to mom and to grandma um, for, uh, for everything all we've done. What is, uh, when we uh, wake up every morning working in nonprofits and sometimes trying to figure out uh, the difficulties that lay ahead, uh, relying on, on folks like Janan and the work that they're doing each and every day is why we do it. So for that, I'm absolutely grateful to have you with you. Um, I, I want to just, I guess, give a little bit of context that I trust a lot of you already know because frankly, you're here. Uh, this is a self-selecting group. <laughs> you have concerns that prompt you to come. Uh, on an evening to um, have these discussions and try to say that uh, we are better than what is happening in our country right now. Uh, that is uh, that is why some of us do the work that we do, and I hope that I'm able to share some things with you that uh, can help you get engaged on those issues more. Uh, I represent an organization called the Arab American Institute. We were founded in 1985 specifically to deal with an issue of exclusion. Uh, Arab Americans were not particularly welcome in our political process at the time. I always start off with this con conversation no matter what I'm talking about because I think it's important to give folks a sense of how far we've come in some way. Um, oddly enough, our mere presence at the table was perceived to be problematic uh, because of a foreign policy issue that we were engaged on. And I referenced the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. There were some who viewed our engagement on that human rights issue as a zero-sum sort of approach in politics. and It was very problematic, so we actually have uh, you all know the important role of money in politics. We had candidates return our contributions saying they didn't want Arab money. And they didn't call it Arab American money. I make, I'm very careful with my language. They called it Arab money, right? It was about, uh, we weren't allowed to frankly be American at the time. So the hyphenated piece hadn't been acquired quite yet. And, and when I say return contributions, I don't mean a local city council race. I mean Mondale, <laughs> a Democratic candidate for president. Um, so it was then when we decided to organize and say that uh, we are keenly aware of all that our public servants were already contributing. We knew about our school board members and delighted to see our public officials with us tonight. We knew about our, our state representatives. We had members of Congress who were already, uh, we had members of the Senate, uh, except that they weren't frankly able to do a lot of the work that they were doing and sometimes very open about their ethnicity. So we organized and came together to do that and needless to say, uh, 30 plus years later, uh, I'm happy to say that we've made tremendous progress. We, we are a very important uh, player in um, what I think are what some of the most important defining civil rights issues of our day. Uh, we do it because it's the right thing to do and we also do it because frankly we're an impacted community, uh, which is where we get to today. Um, the, just as a sort of more context, the, the majority of Arab Americans in the United States are actually Christian, um, and a plurality of American Muslims are actually uh, African American. So it's one of those things where I think people typically conflate the two. When you hear Arab, you hear Muslim, when you hear Muslim, you don't think black. Um, in fact, you often think immigrant, which is also not correct <laughs> in some ways. Uh, I happen to be an immigrant, but the majority of American Muslims in this country are like Janan, not like me. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things where I think it just helps to kind of understand how we all, we all come to these issues. Um, today I'm going to focus specifically on uh, Islamophobia is a term that is commonly used now. I don't use it because I don't think it accurately reflects sort of everything we're dealing with. So I, but I, will, I want to focus on that and then take us to some things that are happening here in Montgomery County. Um, Anti-Muslim and anti-Arab bigotry is a problem, and it has been for a very long time, and it's um, no, uh, no surprise to, to, uh, to folks 
here who would also have been dealing with issues of racism forever and uh, homophobia and other problems. I mean, we, we are an incredible country um, that we're aspirational in terms of our values and there's some things where we've done it exactly right and you know, I am blessed that my parents came to this country and I'm an American now and there's some things we're still struggling with. And I think that's the part where we come together to say this election was very um, eye-opening for us in some ways. And I am of the opinion, I mean, it's funny, I'm not an optimist on these things, but during the campaign, we saw a level of xenophobia and racism and anti-Arab and anti-Muslim bigotry that was extraordinary. At a certain point, it actually, the conversations about the ban, the Muslim ban, which by the way, I just want to be clear, I didn't call it a Muslim ban in the beginning, because I honestly felt like if you're going to target majority Muslim countries, which is the term that we use, the majority of whom are Arab, I didn't quite understand why we were sort of casting it that way. But the way that the ban was initially introduced, it was very, very clear that it was a Muslim ban. There was an exemption placed for minority, religious minority communities that could be exempted. And they were looking specifically at the influx of Syrian refugees and Christian refugees would be allowed in, and the Muslim ones would not. Once, once that was proposed in the initial version, it became very clear, this is truth in advertising that President Trump did exactly what he said he would do during the campaign, which a lot of us frankly thought, this is just to get elected. This is appealing to a certain base. There are certain electoral states in play. And if he does this, then we'll get there, but they'll govern a little differently. I mean, naively, that was my perspective in some ways, because I just generally couldn't believe that it could end up where it ended up. The first Muslim ban is exactly that, a Muslim ban. Now, Muslim ban 2.0, I mean, the wonderful thing about our process, and I'm not an attorney, is that intent is clear once you've actually released the first Muslim ban. So when you went back and fixed the language and tweaked it a bit, so now you don't have the religious minority exception, and you present yourself to a judge and say, no, no, no I fixed everything. I removed one country, we took out Iraq, and then we left the six others, and now there's no religious exemption for minorities, so it's going to be fine. The judges, though, don't suspend reality, and thankfully, They've looked at this in the context that they needed to view, which is that your intent was made clear during the campaign, your intent was made clear when you released it the first time, and your intent is clear as you proceed now through these different cases of it. So I think, uh, like all of you, the response that took place at airports across the country was what this country is about. And it is in, just incredible to see the level of organization that's taking place. Um, I have colleagues at the ACLU who are now, like I had a one person who's a point of contact. There are three people now doing that job because of the contributions that came in and because of the organizations that have, uh, the contributions that have been in place now. The level of organizing that's taking place to push back on this is extraordinary. So what I wanted to mention today is now that this is happening on the federal level, and it is a very challenging place to be on the federal level. I'm sure all of you saw this morning the announcement regarding um, from uh, uh, Attorney General Sessions on uh, the police oversight. Uh, the Obama administration was engaged heavily in dealing with the kind of violence that was taking place by law enforcement targeting uh, young, frankly, young black men, uh, period, full stop. So the ability to go in and investigate that violence that was taking place and, and was, that today's announcement is really quite dramatic. So there are many, many places where this is happening. So on January 20th, literally the day uh, that he was sworn in, we released uh, what we called a rad an advocacy uh, roadmap. And I bring it today, I'm sorry I didn't bring enough copies because it's like 30 pages long, but it's on the website, it's quite prominent on there, aaiusa.org. And I encourage you to look at it because it was designed specifically to say, if our federal government for the next four years is going to operate in this space, how are we going to respond? What are we going to do to organize and push back? And I have to tell you, there are some folks like the Women's March and like others, like the Science March that's coming up, I think, April 22nd, which I'm very excited to be a part of. There are ways where people are going to demonstrations and organizing that way. That's important. There are those of us like my institution, like myself, who will still demand that our government represent us, no matter who's there. So I will still send letters, as I did when a hate crime was just committed a week and a half ago on Sunday, to the Attorney General saying, DC brought charges in this hate crime, um, we want you to bring federal charges forward. I may or may not expect it to happen, but we need to continue to hold them accountable. So one of the ways in which we're suggesting that we all do that 
is a structure that exists with, with our U.S. attorneys across the country. 93 U.S. attorneys are in place. Uh, you may have read the headlines when the president fired them, uh, about half of them. It's actually quite normal for a new president to come in and say thank you, you may now leave, but usually transition is a bit smoother, <laughs> and you allow time for someone to come in and replace them. Um, that didn't happen in this case, but that's fine. There are civil rights officers within those U.S. attorney's offices that, that are there. There are state attorneys, state attorney generals that exist in each of these states. Um, these are very important places for us to insert our voice in terms of what's happening. So when the Muslim ban came out, there were 12 state attorney generals, mostly southern states, who filed an amicus brief in support of the president's position. We were able to go immediately to those states, get our people engaged, to say, write your U.S. attorneys, write your state attorney general, saying, why would you possibly join this amicus brief when we know the impact is the following? Those are the kinds of things that we think are important to happen during a time like this. So getting us to sort of Montgomery County, we live in a great place. I'm a resident of Montgomery County. I have two kids in our school system. Frankly, the experience that Jeanette just had is how I know we live in a great place. There was a problem that was identified, people deployed, <laughs> 40,000 signatures is what I heard, is that right? That's incredible, and therefore there's a response. That's how our system is supposed to work. It's a small d democracy that only works if we're engaged. So we're engaged and if someone's responsive and we were able to do that. So I think we're, we're, we benefit from living in Macarmy County and in Maryland in that we, we have an audience receptive to those concerns. One of the things that I just want to mention and then we'll wrap up here because I think it's something that our county hasn't gotten right is, is this issue of countering violent extremism. Um, it's a difficult subject to talk about because anybody would say I'm not clear what is your issue with countering violent extremism because it's a it's, it's, a, it's branded, I think, quite effectively. Um, but I just want to share with you that we have been engaged on this issue dating back to 2009, um, when the Obama administration first began to engage um, on it. We were heavily engaged when they were beginning to roll it out in pilot cities across the country. They did so in um, Boston, in Minneapolis, in Los Angeles. Uh, the reason we're engaged on an issue like this is that it makes the mistake of suggesting that American Muslims require special attention when it comes to national security issues. That they are a community who is ready to become quote unquote radicalized, potentially violent, if we don't step in and help them with resilience programming, help them by engaging them in ways that um, can prevent them from say waking up one morning and saying, I want to do what I'm seeing on TV in you know, parts of the world across the country. Um, this is a very dangerous way to view our community. Uh, and I will tell you this because uh, there is a problem uh, with recruitment, uh, particularly in a post-ISIS environment. But luckily, it's not one that we've experienced here in any massive numbers at all in the United States. They've seen it in Europe. Foreign fighters in Syria were coming from European cities, much to the surprise. They saw terrorist attacks there. Um, but the fact is, we haven't had the kind of problem that warrants this kind of response. So that's the first point. And, and having said that, I would say to you, one is too many. That goes without saying. <laughs> but the problem is that you can't securitize a government's relationship with an entire community based on these individual cases. Second point is, there's nothing that's demonstrated that there is CBE programming that works. It is not based in any science. And part of what's happened here is that the Montgomery County model that began um, um, specifically here, um, has been sort of taken nationwide. And uh, the individual who used to, uh, I believe, running here is now part of the FBI um, in terms of the programming that's done there. So when I heard about this, as, as a resident, I said, wait, what's going on in my county? Like, I was generally concerned. Is there, is there ISIS recruitment? Is there some kind of violent incident that's taking place that would warrant this kind of program? That has not been the case. <laughs> Um, and unfortunately, it, it started as sort of this cottage industry where people were saying, frankly, a lot of government resources were being dedicated to it, universities were generating a lot of funding by conducting research, so people started to pay attention to it in a way that would suggest there's a problem here and we needed to engage, and to the contrary. What it's done is it's made, uh, in some ways, our young people who are born here, who've never even gone overseas for the first time ever to sort of see themselves as this existential other, to view themselves through a different securitized lens. And I just find that that's not the American experience. The 
American experience is completely contrary to that. And it's why it's important that we be able to sort of critically examine these programs. Uh, I'm happy to say <coughs> that it took the, the election of someone like President Trump for people to start asking questions about the program because there was not a lot of pushback under the Obama administration. Though I would tell you we were very actively pursuing it, uh, opposition to it as a civil rights concern. Uh, but now that that his administration has taken over, in a hearing prior to that, one of the witnesses said that the problem with CDE programming is that it's called countering violent extremism. The reality is we should be calling it countering violent Islamism or countering violent Islam. So it hasn't been rebranded. It's not clear whether it will be rebranded. Uh, our concern, though, is that frankly, it had been targeting Muslims to begin with and will continue to do so. Uh, and I'm not of the opinion, I can, I can show you statistics that say white supremacists in the United States pose a larger security threat than, than American Muslim, any attacks from, from Muslims. I don't like to do that because I don't think it's a competition about data. A bad program is a bad program, whether it's applied here or there. But I just wanted to sort of note that, that even the rationale about we have to do these programs to keep us safer is not based on logic. Um, so with that, I'll just say, um, I'd love to open it up for Q&A if that's okay. I will defer to my...